And uh, also before I start, can I also thank Maureen Niegesa and uh, John Coleman and Thomas Murphy uh, for their work in preparing uh, tonight's event. So uh, you're all very welcome, uh, everybody. And uh, just before I start the content, I'd just like to uh, introduce you to our company. Uh, in LBS Partners, um, we believe in great data uh, and it's, it's decision-making based on data is what we do. Uh, we believe in great processes in looking for the losses in those processes uh, and helping companies uh, to, uh, to reduce those losses as much as practically possible. And then we, we finally believe in great people. Uh, it's about collaborative approach. Uh, we don't go in and impose solutions with a client. Uh, we, we work with the client to make sure that they understand the principles that are underpinning the, the process improvement. And what we offer in, in services, uh, a lot of transformation in, in, in business, in digital. Digital transformation is a, a new sphere uh, for us, especially now as we're moving online uh, in lean transformation and so on. And, and in training, uh, we do a lot of lean training. Our lean green belt is particularly popular uh, as is our management and leadership development. Uh, feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. There's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on there and you get access uh, to events and different things that are going on. So uh, it's quite active and uh, uh, it would be great to see as many people as possible follow us on LinkedIn. For tonight's session, uh, we want to talk about OEE. Uh, we want to talk about the concepts and the purpose of what OEE is, so that's just some capability building. Uh, we want to learn how to calculate it. And I'll go through two uh, different methodologies uh, of measuring OEE. Uh, we look at the very important part that visual management plays uh, in making sure that our OEE is visible uh, and that we understand what the losses are. Uh, and we touch on continuous improvement which is what, where this really matters, where we use the data that we've collected in OEE measurement uh, to uh, see our losses and to improve them and eliminate them. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about some tips on implementation. And this is our roadmap. Uh, these first four are the ones that we've described there, capability building and, and so on. And this last one then is some, just some tips on how we would go about implementing steps one to four. Starting off then and, and, and understanding what overall equipment effectiveness is. Uh, we're trying to define the 100% OE, which is the perfect day from the machine point of view. And that is the machine is running at 100% of its speed, not faster, not slower, 100% of the speed that that machine was designed to run at. We're running defect free. The machine is not creating any rejects. We have 100% quality. And during that shift or during that day, we have zero interruptions in the machine. We don't have jams on the machine where we have to start and stop. And we don't have breakdowns on the machine where we have to replace a gearbox or a, a sensor or something like that. So 100% speed, 100% quality and no stops. Uh, so therefore OEE is a capacity utilization measure. We can see what our installed capacity is even though we mightn't be availing of all of that capacity, but at least we'd know what that is. And an OEE should not be used for labor intensive operations. Uh, if the operator is, is uh, if you're doing a manual assembly operation, for example, OEE is not the measure. There are other things that we can do there, but not, not OEE. And this is our waterfall then uh, that we would use to describe the breakdown of the OEE losses. And, and I've split them, and these are pretty arbitrary, these three here on availability and performance and quality. Uh, I don't tend to, to deal with this. This is just a handy way of maybe 
summarizing or, or uh, tabulating the losses. But you know, when you're when you're actively working in OEE on the floor, you're going to be over on this side dealing with the losses. So let's go through on availability. We have the total calendar time, seven days a week, twenty four hours a day, and then we would schedule some or all of that time. Uh, for production on this equipment. So we would have a scheduled time and that could be uh, three shifts on five days or two shifts on five days or whatever it is. So we're taking out the unscheduled time here. And now we're getting to the performance losses and, and the machine might be running at a slower speed than it was designed. So we have some speed loss. Uh, we'd have some planned downtime. Uh, staff go on their breaks and maybe stop the machine. Uh, we're stopping the machine to do our maintenance routines, autonomous maintenance or progressive maintenance. Uh, and then we're stopping to do our planned changeovers where we're changing the machine from one product to another. And then we have unplanned downtime, uh, which is those breakdowns where the machine is, is stopping, uh, something breaks and we have to replace it. Or we might have a minor stop where the machine is just jammed and it needs some intervention from the operator. Uh, so there, there are other things that eat into OEE. And then down on the quality side, we might have a yield. So there might be some byproduct that's uh, been taken out. Uh, so, uh, and also we have rejected product. So what's our, what's our, 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 yield, our sorry, our re reject losses. In our, so you, you take your scrap out. And when you take all of those losses out, you're left with net productive time when we're actually making good product. And OEE, uh, and I'm talking now about OEE too. Uh, so let's just talk about that for, for a brief second. If you base the, 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 the calculation on total calendar time, if that's what you're measuring against, then that's what's called OEE one. But if we're taking out the unscheduled time and we're only measuring the scheduled time, then that's what's called OE2. In reality, nobody is measuring OE1 anymore. Uh, it's not an effective, uh, because if we're only scheduling the machine for five days, uh, why would we say our, our percentage OE is less because we're not utilizing uh, the weekend time? That's more of a, of a management or, or a customer decision, ultimately. Uh, so I'm going to talk about OE and I'm going to talk about OE2, and they mean the same thing. Uh, I just don't mean OE1. Uh, so OE2, if we, if we measure all of the losses against the scheduled time, uh, we get OE2. So net productive time, which is this here with all of the losses taken out, divided by the schedule time, which is this one here, how long the machine is, is operating for, uh, multiply by 100%, then that's OE2 and perfect OE is, is 100%. We can't do better than 100%. Why are we measuring it then? Well, first and foremost, we want to see the losses. We have, we have a mantra saying, do not hide your losses. If you, if you can't see them, you probably can't fix them or you're, you're not even aware. Um, so we want to see those losses and we want to improve the productivity or the capacity to demand ratio. Uh, and this, if we do these things, then we might be able to avoid or de delay CapEx where we're saying we need a new machine, we don't have enough capacity. But if we're only using 50% of the capacity because our OE is running at 50%, um, then, there's another way to do that. Uh, you avoid that very, very serious amount of, of CapEx uh, by making the machine run better. Uh, culturally, what we also see is that when we do it properly and we involve the whole team, the maintenance people, the quality people, uh, the line leaders, and significantly the operators, uh, we're getting great empowerment and, and great collaboration um, uh, and, and that really helps the culture. Uh, 
And also OEE2 facilitates benchmarking. Uh, so we can very easily uh, compare how a machine is working, machine A is working versus machine B, or department one is, how is that uh, comparing to department, department two, uh, or even to do external benchmarking, uh, it can be used. And what are the pitfalls for OEE? If the line leaders are not engaged, then that's a significant problem. Uh, and we also sometimes see that we can get pushback from operators. Um, the management or the stakeholders may be critical if we start measuring it and the measurement is very low, um, then uh, that can lead to some criticism and, and then we just drive it underground again. Uh, if, uh, I believe that planning need to be involved in this the, the way we plan the line can have a significant impact on OEE by reducing the number of changeovers or planning those changeovers uh, to, to suit operations. And that doesn't always happen. Uh, please avoid overly complicated implementations and sometimes there are cultural uh, obstacles. Moving along then uh, to baseline setting and, and measurement. Let's see what, what we want to do here. Uh, okay, let's put the trim up. Uh, so we want to, in this section where we're just starting to do our measure, we want to achieve three things. We want to, to know what that 100% machine output is. Uh, so we have to define perfect. We have to understand what that is uh, and we have to know that number. Once we have that number, then we can see what the machine is actually performing and that's our OE2 uh, number. And thirdly, we want to commit those shift numbers to a database so that we can see some trends and we can uh, facilitate the continuous improvement effort. Uh, the database is critical uh, and that design of that database is critical to make sure that that happens. Let's look at defining perfect. 100% OEE is the base plate machine cycles per minute multiplied by the number of minutes per shift. And in, in an eight hour shift, uh, that's 460 minutes. Um, so you have to know what the, 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 the machine was designed for. It's the absolute maximum production volume that can be achieved without any of these waterfall losses happening. Okay, forget about the schedule time, but all of these losses here. Um, and it should be independently verified. Uh, this is not something that the, the, the team leaders or the production managers should be doing. This is for the engineers or for the equipment manufacturers. And it should be independently verified. It's not the maximum demonstrated performance values uh, or, or performance figures that have been seen on the machine. So you can't say the 100% is 10,000 units because the most we ever, ever, ever achieved on this machine in an eight hour shift was 10,000. That's not the way to calculate. This is a scientific measure and you have to get that right. And there are three rules uh, that we set. So OE is measured against the resource constraint, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, but generally in the machine, there's a bottleneck operation, and that operation is where we're measuring against. If we're doing it properly, we should never see 100% uh, greater than 100% OE, uh, and I've seen it. Uh, it just means we haven't defined perfect correctly. And the third rule, which is sometimes a little bit contentious when you get down to implementation, is that the labor operations must be excluded from this first rule. So the resource constraint is an equipment constraint. It's not a labor constraint. And we'll see an example of that coming up. I want now to take a this is a 
fictional. You can you can put in your own pictures and your own mind's eye in terms of your own equipment. But basically, we have product coming in on this side, and we have processed product coming out on this side. And this is all one machine with no whip or buffers in between, and it flows through a conveyor or a robot directly from one piece of the equipment to the other. In this case, I've just said it's a board loader, it's a board cutter, and it's board offloader. Uh, and in this example, the spec for the board lo loader is 18 boards per minute, and the cutter is 23, and the offloader is 20. And it's all set and rated by the equipment manufacturing or by engineering. Where is our resource constraint in this example? I think everybody would agree it's at the board loader because it's the slowest operation, 18 boards per minute. And now we want to calculate what the 100% OE in an eight hour shift is. And if we were live in a hotel someplace, it would be giving out a bottle of wine for somebody who had the right answer. Uh, but in this case, it's 18 boards per minute multiplied by 460 minutes uh, in a shift, which is 8640. 8640 is our loss free OEE, 100% OEE on this line. And now let's say the shift produces 6,104 boards in an eight hour shift. So what's the OEE? Very simply, it's 6,104 divided by our 100%, eight, six, four, oh, which gives us 70.6. Now, light bulb moment here, to calculate the OEE, we didn't need to know what any of these losses were. So it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's the level one loss. Uh, we know that we're losing 30%, 29% uh, of capacity of, of output loss from ideal on this equipment. And that's the key concept for OEE. We're measuring against ideal. Now in this example, the actual line has a board loader, a board cutter, an offloader, but when the boards come out, they have to be strapped by the operator. And the best that the operator can do is 15 boards per minute. So nothing has changed, but we've just, we have to do this. This could not be automated or wasn't automated, let's say. What's, what's our resource constraint in this case? And how do we measure 100% OEE when we have a mix of equipment and labor operations all mixed into the one line. Well, it's very simple. We said in rule three, the labor operations were not included uh, as the, the resource constraints, so it's still the same. It's based on the 18 boards per minute and it's 8,640 boards. You will find that you will get pushback on this uh, in, in especially from operators and perhaps maybe from line leaders as well. Um, where people say it's just not possible to run this line. You know, we can only run it at 15 boards per minute and that's all we can do. Well, I'm sorry, that's not utilizing the equipment to its full extent. Uh, and it's a loss to the equipment performance and it must be included in OEE. I want to look at a harder case here. Uh, and that's all of what we looked at before is all very well on till we started introducing different products with different uh, constraints or different run rates. You could imagine that a, an eight by four board could, could run at 18, but a four by four board probably will run a, a bit faster because it's smaller. Um, so let's say we have in this case, the original line was running for an eight by four board, was running at 18 boards per minute, uh, but a smaller board could run faster. And we do turn up the machine uh, when we run the uh, four by four board. Uh, so now it becomes a little bit more complex to measure the OE in this case, because now we're, we're dealing with two targets. So how do we know? Um, 
So let's say in this example, the production made 2008 by four and they made 4,200 four by four boards in an eight hour shift. Now, what you're not being told and what we probably don't know is how long did it take to make the 2000 and how long did it take to make the 4000? We just know that blended on the blended production day, we made 2000 of those and we made 4200 of those and it took us eight hours. So now how do we calculate our OE in this example? It's actually quite simple, but we, we use a different, a slightly different calculation in this case. And how we do it is we say, ideally at 100% OE to make the, the 2008 by four at 18 boards per minute should take us 111 minutes if you do the calculation. And to make 4,200 four by four sheets at 30 boards per minute, it should take us 140 minutes. So in total, it should have taken us 251 minutes to make both of these at those quantities, but it actually took 480. So if you divide the 250 by the 480, we're getting 52% OE on that shift. Uh, it's just slightly different thought process, uh, but I think it's quite effective for you have multiple standards uh, and that will frequently be the case. So we would look at OE then as the level one loss. And the level two losses are the reason why, and you should be very, very choiceful and strategic about uh, the level two losses. Uh, and what I've seen happen is that management and managers want to know down to the very last loss, we want to know nearly down to the cylinder uh, where our losses are. But unless you have an automated data collection system that puts too much onus on the operators and too much overhead on the operators to, to collect that data manually. So please don't do it. Uh, I would say you should be looking at, if you're collecting the data manually, I would say five to seven losses. And, and I've suggested here that you break it down into planned loss, uh, which is your changeovers, your uh, maintenance intervention, your planned maintenance interventions, and your staff breaks, for example, and the unplanned losses are maybe speed, and we want to know what the quality uh, rejects are, uh, and we want to know machine breakdowns, unplanned uh, maintenance interventions. Uh, so that might be six uh, that we want, to, we want to collect at the level two. And you mightn't have enough information in that to do your continuous improvement, but we'll deal with that in, in, in the next section coming up. And finally, then we want to design a database to collect uh, the data. Uh, this should be by shift. Uh, usually it's, it's, in, it's in Excel. Uh, we're doing daily entry, hopefully. Um, somebody owns that data. Uh, and is responsible for making sure that it's updated. Uh, data 6S is critically important here. I've seen a lot of databases that are just unusable because there's all sorts of notes and different things. Uh, just keep it tidy, please. Uh, and make sure that you're doing regular uh, backups of data. This data is critically important to your enterprise. Uh, please do not do not lose it. It's, uh, it's a big problem if you do. Uh, now, this is, this is a, an example of a database uh, that I was working on with a client, so I've, I've just shaded out some of the stuff, but just stand back from this at the moment, and, and I just want to draw your attention to how I go about a, a database design. And I just think about three things. I think about data entry, and I try to keep the data entry uh, in consecutive columns to make it easy for the person who is entering uh, just to enter the data. Uh, and then we get Excel to do some of the heavy lifting in, term, heavy lifting in terms of the analysis uh, of the data. So that's in gray. And then I've added in two sheets here, which are just error checking to make sure that there are no stupid data entry uh, uh, issues going on on that shift. So. Uh, 
we, for example, the uh, the total OEE losses, uh, um, the, the losses themselves uh, should add up to 100%, let's say. Um, so we just want to want to make sure that. But uh, green for data entry and grey for analysis is is basically what you, you'll be doing. Okay, uh, so we're going on to the implementation roadmap. Um, uh, and here we just want to, in this part of the, the roadmap, we want to talk about our visual management, critical part of seeing the losses. It's going to start at the machine for the operators to collect some data. So that uh, I'm showing a chart here. It's generally not a. It's not a chart like this. It's generally a, a log, uh, where they're they're noting down on at, at ten past ten. I had a breakdown, and and they're putting in a code for one of those six level losses that we described earlier, um, and the machine started back up at ten twenty, something like that. And this is the number of products that I got per hour or whatever. So. Uh, it's impossible for the operators once they get to the end of the shift to remember what all the losses are. So you have to give them some kind of, of a log uh, to record that as the shift progresses. And I'm not sure, you know, our pit meetings, our performance, our issues and our targets board, uh, how we visualize our results for our department. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with that visual factory tool. Uh, and just make sure that we're measuring our OEE uh, on that board. And then we're going to commit our results to the database and we can do some historical analysis, uh, generally in a, in a pie chart or, or in a run chart of some sort. Uh, and that's all there is to visual management, but uh, so it's simple enough, but it's critically important that it's done properly. Moving on then to continuous improvement. And this is where it really gets the fun part of OEE is in this section. The North Star for OEE would be generally accepted to be 85%. So we're running our machine at 85% of its capacity with 15% taken out for the losses. And generally what we like to see is that the unplanned losses are 5% and then we have 10% for planned losses. So changeovers are planned and our maintenance, uh, our planned maintenance is 5%. Uh, so that gives us a good idea of a machine operating at good levels of efficiency uh, and its, quite, its performance is quite predictable. Moving on then to a, a real life uh, example. So this is what you might see. Uh, so we have we have we, oops, uh, we have some speed losses. Let's say nine percent. We have seven percent breakdown, and we have fourteen percent for our maintenance interventions. We have uh, twenty five percent for changeover, leaving OE at forty five percent percent. Now here's an interesting thing. If we said from this example, I think everybody would agree that we want to do something with our changeover if we want to have any hope of improving OE. And let's say we set ourselves a target initially of taking this from 25 and we wanted to have the amount of time being done with the changeover. So we're going to, we're going to improve our OE, uh, sorry, we're going to uh, reduce our changeover time, let's say by 12%. So what's our OEE going to change to? If we're taking 12% out of this, what's our OEE going to be after we're doing that? A lot of people would say, well, it's going to be 57%. Well, you're going to be disappointed because that won't happen. Uh, generally in this example, uh, half of the improvement that you're making on changeovers, in this case, we said we're going to prove this by 12%. Half of that will show up in OEE. Uh, so we're going to 51% because don't forget, once you do your changeover time more efficiently, okay, that's going to improve OEE, but now you're going to run to the next changeover quicker. So you're actually going to do more changeovers, uh, which is going to take this back up again. Uh, 
if you have time-based maintenance or whatever, uh, you're going to do more maintenance and you're going, because you can't have a speed loss when you're doing your changeover because the machine is not running. If you're running for more time, then you're going to get more speed loss. So your speed loss is going to come back up a bit. Uh, so just don't be disappointed when you, when you make an intervention and, and actually achieve what you set out it's not all going to go to OE. It'll, it'll flow, in this case, about half and half because the OE is, we're saying, around 45%. The other thing that's important for continuous, improve, continuous improvement is that once we achieve a target, then we're setting the target higher. So we set us as a target here of, of 45%. We achieved it, and now we set the target to 50 and we're gonna achieve that and then we're gonna, so this is true continuous improvement. Please don't get into a mindset where, okay, we've, we've achieved that and, and we're done. You're never done until you get to 85. In terms of the culture and so on, I don't believe that it's, it's really, possible to sustain OE improvements without involving the operators. I think this is a cross-functional, we need quality, we need maintenance, we need engineers, we need the operators and we need the team leaders. We need everybody looking at this the same way and trying to achieve the results. The operators are key though, and I just love this phrase. It's an old phrase in, in lean terminology, go see, ask why, show respect. Uh, and we could do a, a full webinar on, on that topic on its own. OE measures machine performance. We're not interested in measuring the amount of time that the operator is away on the break or out on a cigarette break or whatever. We just want to measure machine performance and that's the only thing we're trying to measure. So keep the machines busy, but keep people organized. So we may need to reorganize the way the work is done. And sometimes the, the cultural issues are harder to fix than the technical ones. Some notes on uh, implementation. First of all, build capability, the same as we're hopefully doing a little bit here tonight, uh, is just introducing the team to what OEE is and what we're trying to do. Uh, so this is the school day. Uh, and then just go and start measuring it. I would say when you're implementing the measurement rollout, I would tackle it at a departmental level first. So if you have six machines in a department, every machine get, gets its own OEE measure. Uh, and we're, we're starting to measure all machines at the same time within the one department. And once we're done, we'll move to the next department and we'll start measuring it there. And just remember the data, in my experience, OEE data is never 100% clean. So get rid of the obvious errors, but there's going to be a bit of ambiguity left and you're just going to have to deal with it. And finally then, uh, once we have OE measure in place, we want to go and start in our continuous improvement effort. And that must be one machine at a time. Uh, don't stretch your resources too thin here. Just take a machine, go and do that. And then you can reapply if, uh, and use your problem solving standards that you have within your company, make sure you're using those when you're doing the continuous improvement. So it's A3 or DMake would be the one that I would use most frequently. I think it's a, it's a, a great process. Uh, it's data driven uh, and we do the analysis and then we, we move on to improvement. Uh, so make sure that you're using that problem solving uh, standard uh, as part of this. And that's really what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, so if we wanted to recap, that was what we were trying to do. Uh, and at this stage, I'm going to pass it back to Jim. And if we have any Q&A, Jim, uh, we can deal with it here. Yeah, sure. I, I, that was excellent, Damon. Um, thanks very much for a very good uh, overview of OE2. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we do have some questions. Let me just flick up to the top. Um, first question in is from Ronan Murphy. 
and he asks what is an appropriate measure for a long cycle batch api process with a cycle time of 5 to 14 days ooh ooh that's a tough one um so that's more I, I i take it then that's not more manufacturing that's more process um, yeah yeah so, a pharmaceutical process so i uh, sort of bulk api I, I i don't know is that a biologics line or is it chemical uh, farm but it'd be one of those it would be in a pharmaceutical plant yeah uh, the bad news is that the 85 percent uh, um, North Star standard that I said was for was for assembly and, and, and manufacturing uh, for process it would be even higher so for process industries we're, we would set the North Star at about 92 percent um, so that's a, that, that's an issue um, so again you have to decide what your your time is right so in this case we're saying what was 14 days for the batch yeah between five to 14 between five to 14 um so you, you have to decide what the time is and and then you have to go and measure it right uh, and really the only loss that you're you're interested in then generally in those we don't have short stops or or, or whatever normally the batch runs out to completion and then we have to empty uh, we have to to process the product and uh, we have to, to get the equipment ready for the next batch uh, so you're just you're just measuring that time uh, so uh, i think that's the only way to do it set your standard uh, and everything else is a loss every time once the process is finished the downtime starts and the oee starts to 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 build the oee losses start to build up okay um, so I'm not sure does that help, uh, but but that's the only way to do it. Okay. The the next question is from Michael Moore, and he asks: Are changes to lines taken into consideration when using OE? Are changes to lines? So just explain any idea of what that is, Jim? What kind of I, change? I, I I would imagine if you're, and I could be totally wrong here, if you're in the middle of a production and you stop to make a change to the line or a, you know an adjustment I'm, I'm thinking or maybe is it that it could be are you if you change over a line to take a different product maybe if you could feel both of those I'm, i might have covered the right one yeah um well the, the changeovers if we're changing from product a to product b then uh, we, we we looked at two ways of measuring and one was uh where uh, we just had a single standard uh uh, and, and that's easy, but this one, I suspect he's talking about a changeover where the second product coming up has a different standard. Uh, and we dealt with that in the slides uh, in, in terms of the time. Okay. Um, so they just remember that when the machine is running, then that's fine. But the very minute uh, in terms of the changeover, we define the changeover as the time taken from the last good product of batch A to the first good product being produced on batch B. So the, uh, the downtime in between finishing off batch A and starting batch B, that is your, 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 your calculation. Uh, and that's, that's with the line running at standard. So uh, the changeover is not really finished until we're up to speed on batch B. Uh, so that must be taken into account. Okay. Uh, another question here now from David Griffiths. Considering a bottle filling and packing line, um, example, filling solids into bottles, then inserting into cartons and packing further into outers, how would you determine the quality factor when all rejected items are reworked? In other words, put back into the machines for packing. But they're not reworked, are they? They're, um, are these... Um, there will be rejected items and they're you i think what he, he may be getting at here is the rejected items aren't actually scrapped they can be reused yeah uh, that's yeah it's, that's um, it's, it's a very good question uh, generally uh, 
I think it's just cleaner to take them as rejects. If they have, if they have to be reworked, then you're going to get value for them later on. But the equipment didn't do its job. Uh, yeah. So I would just take them out the first time. Uh, once we report the OE on the shift, we don't like to go back and change the database uh, later on. So if in a week's time they were found to be rejected, uh, generally we don't go back and, and change the database. Uh, what we capture, we capture and, 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 and we go with it. Um, so in this case, uh, I would just, if they have to be reworked, then it's an OEE loss, uh, uh, but we are, we're not scrapping them, we're getting value for them once we do that. But the machine didn't do its job, uh, I would say it's a hit to OEE. Okay, okay. And uh, another question then from David as well. This is a good one actually, and in the absence of an automated OEE data collection and display system, what would be the best manual based approach to collecting data or doing calculations? Very simple. Just keep it. You have to keep it simple. If, if you imagine you're that operator and you're being asked to, to account for every bit of downtime, uh, that's really, really difficult to do. When you're in the white heat of battle down on the line and, and the machine breaks down, your only focus as an operator is getting the machine back running again. Uh, and then the machine is back up running and then you're, you're uh, 10 minutes later, you're, oh my God, what time did the machine start at? It's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, and that's why I was saying there's a lot of ambiguity in the data, uh, especially when the data is collected manually. Uh, I was asked at one stage to, to implement a system uh, with 25 different reason codes for downtime. Uh, and, and it was being done manually. It just makes no sense. Uh, so just keep it very, very simple for the, for the operators um, and mm -hmm. see, can you give them any, any uh, help uh, in terms of, uh, you know, a big, a big clock or, you know, something that's easy to, to, to figure out uh, what time. Uh, use andons on the machine as well uh, to, to help. So if the machine is down, you want an alarm or at least a, a light uh, flashing or whatever to alert the operators, especially if they're looking after multiple machines. And in the example that you showed us, where they were cutting the boards and packing the boards, it, it wouldn't. There was. There didn't seem to be too much automation there for counting. Was that like a physical count that they did? Was it was almost like? Uh, uh, yeah, no. That, the, that was that that that, that was somebody standing uh, there just doing a calculation on a, a piece of paper and then going away. Uh, I'll I give you a little hint, Jim. Those pictures were taken off the internet. Right? It's not, <laughs> okay. Uh, I just thought it, proves, it proves you can do it if you want to. You could do it manually. Oh, but you yeah. have to. You have to physically measure somehow, and it, it's if it's not automated, then it's going to be laborious because you know you physically have to stand and count or stand and watch. But uh, it, can, it can be done. Generally, it's one thing we're very good at in manufacturing is knowing the quantity that came off the machine. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're quite good at that. We, we know what that is. Uh, what we're not good at is analyzing the downtime. Um, so when did the machine stop and when did we restart it? Uh, so the, the, that's what I was calling the level two losses. Um, yeah. They're, they're a bit more difficult. But from an OEE point of view, it's very, very simple because we know the quantity that should have been made and we know the quantity we did make uh, and that gives us our OEE. So generally the OEE numbers can be, uh, uh, they can be calculated, you know, within a percent or two of accuracy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is what I call, Jim, this is what I call directional data. We need directional data. We don't need it down to two decimal places. Uh, so I don't get worried about it. It's just impossible uh, to get OEE data to that level. Uh, and I see a question from somebody popping up there where they're saying that, uh, you know, the, the data has been faked. Uh, so if you don't put in the right data uh, and you're artificially inflating your OEE numbers, you will never solve it. You will never improve it. Mm -hmm. Keep your problems visible. Yeah. Okay, uh, a question here from John Coleman. Um, OEE is highly dependent on machine performance, which is impacted by people. Technology is moving forward at an unprecedented pace. How can a business keep the skill set up to date to match the rate of change? 
and it may be a, a, a wider, broader question than just the OEE there. But in your experience, what what do you see as the the key challenges for people skilling, upskilling in new technologies at the moment? Um, you know, uh, so th there is there is a kind of a rush to automation uh, and to higher levels of com complexity in the in the equipment. Uh, what I see, uh, you know, especially in the SME sector, uh, we're seeing a lot of old equipment uh, that is being underutilized. Um, so it's not about that in the SME sector. Uh, generally, when you get into the pharmaceutical and, and so on, uh, you're seeing that. Uh, but the teams need to be invested in, they need to be trained, they need to understand uh, how the machine performs and, and what, their, what their role is, what to touch and what not to touch. Um, uh, and, and that's just down to training and, and investing in the people. Um, mm. Okay, a uh, question here from Liam O'Leary. Uh, he says, it's a great presentation. Uh, how do you factor in, or do you factor in numbers of operators per shift in an OE calculation? Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, uh, so we see that all the time. Um, we didn't reach our figures today because uh, we, were, we were supposed to have five people on the team and we only had four. Uh, so it'll come into speed loss, for example. People will turn down the speed of the machine or they'll turn off the machine to allow uh, people to catch up. Uh, and it's all a loss to OEE. Uh, some people uh, decide that they're going to have one OEE figure for a four, a four person shift, and they're going to have a different OEE for a five person shift. And I think that's just the wrong thing to do. You know, the, the purity of the OEE is that we're measuring the capacity of the machine. And that doesn't change whether we have four operators or five operators. The machine is still capable of producing its 100% OEE. Um, so now we're down to explaining uh, the loss. Yep. Uh, and what I'd much prefer to do is set the standard at five. Uh, and if, if we're only running, uh, uh, you know, uh, four or, or, or three on a machine, I'd prefer to shut the machine down uh, and and deploy that to another line and and then come back and, and schedule the line for the the for, at the proper standard and run it flat out when we're doing it my my push always is when we start that machine we have the intent to run that machine at the best possible rate uh, uh, so we're, 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 we're planning it properly. And sometimes the labor deployment is quite difficult. Uh, you know, we've all been, and any of us that have been involved in it, it's quite complex and, and we're at the mercy of absenteeism and, and, and different priorities on different lines uh, and so on. Uh, but I don't think you can deviate from the fact that OEE is a, an equipment measure and we want to measure where we are against that 100% level. Okay, I want to go back to a question there that Brian Murphy asked. I know we, we just alluded to it a while ago. He was asking, how would you suggest improving the database entries for losses? My experience is that it can be neglected and sometimes even faked. So yeah. is there, I think, it, is there some way of incentivizing people to almost say how bad they are first before they start to improve? Yeah, it's, it's, it's always a strange thing when we go in to measure uh, things. So th the first thing is, it, it, when I go into a company and they're not measuring OE, and we say, okay, so where are we now? We're going to start measuring OE. The very minute we start talking about it, the machine performance improves. We haven't done anything. We haven't changed anything. Uh, but the results always improve in that first couple of weeks. Uh, just where we're implementing the, the measure and we're, um, and we're starting to talk to people about it. Uh, and it's the old adage, you are what you measure. Uh, yeah. But in reality, you know, he's right. Uh, the data is not always a truthful account of what's going on. Uh, and, and you just have to keep pushing that all the time. Uh, and what I suggest is a bit like a 6S audit or 
any other type of audit where we would look at the health check for that system, you need to do a health check on the OEE measure as well. So it's impossible to, to look at it and measure it and to assess it every day. But once a week or once a month, we could take a shift and we could analyze that shift uh, for the quality of the data that's been generated uh, yeah. and then feed it back to the teams. Uh, so we didn't touch on that in the presentation, but I think that's a very important point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, a question here for, uh, from Laura Fitton. One second now, my screen just moved. Um, what would you advise of the effectiveness of having an independent associate or operator taking the data um, as their job in an activity analysis um, whilst a, a, a second associate is running the machine? And do you think this would be a, an efficient way of doing this rather than getting, I think, the guy who's operating the line to take the data initially, getting someone who's just there to concentrate on the, measuring the losses? Have you seen that? Yes. Uh, well, we're relying on the data that's generated for from the line, and that has to be the operator. Um, and then I think the question might be related to, well, who commits that data to the database? And, and generally, you know, in a lot of cases, that would not be the operator. Uh, that could be the team leader, uh, or it could be a process engineer, or, or something like that. Um, uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm picking that up from that question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that's not so important, uh, but whoever is the owner of that data needs to make sure that it's, it's being put in on time and that we're, we're doing the analysis correctly uh, of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, you know, that there should be no place to hide in OEE, but the reality is people do fudge the numbers uh, and you just have to keep pushing back about that, making sure that it's been done properly, um, at least in a directional sense. So that if we're saying the biggest loss on this line is changeover, that, okay, so if it's 12% or 13%, we don't mind that. Or if it's 12% or 15%, we don't mind that. Uh, but if, if, it's, if it's being accounted for on the line as the biggest loss, then it should be the biggest loss. We, we need to rely directionally on that data, even though it does need to be 100% correct, if that makes sense. Okay, yep. Uh, John Byrne has a question on, do you exclude cleaning time between batches or campaigns when calculating OE? No, you do not exclude it. It has to be included because we're measuring the equipment uh, capacity and how much of that capacity that we're doing. So remember, if if the batch finished and we could find a way instantaneously to start the next batch, then that's we're getting very very close to one hundred percent one hundred percent OEE. So you, the, the, in fact, in 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 campaigns like the one that John is talking about here, where we're generally talking about the cleaning time between the batches as being the most significant loss. Uh, so we must find a way to improve that uh, every week, every month. Yeah. Okay. Uh, David Purcell has a question. What department in a company generally takes ownership of OEE? Is it usually the production department or the lean engineering department or lean group? So the, the, the leaders are usually the process engineers, usually, uh, but it depends on, on the company. For, for SMEs, it could be different because there's usually a flatter structure there. Um, and for, for large multinationals, uh, it might be a, a bit more stratified. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no, generally, I, I think we're talking about, I presume uh, David is here talking about the, the data because uh, there's, there's a couple of factors here. Who takes ownership for the OEE results? Well, that has to be line leadership, the production yeah. guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when we go to the pit board in the morning and we're reporting OEE, then that's the operators and the team leader. If we're talking about where the data is managed at the database level, then that could be a, a different person. It could be a service that's been provided to production department from a, a process engineer or somebody like that. Okay. 
Right, we've just two time for probably two more questions, two quick questions. Um, Peter Mullen is asking, have you come across any simple means of downtime and fault code recording, if not gathered automatically? Um, for instance, using a tablet or a smartphone? A lot, a lot of companies are moving that way now, uh, putting tablets uh, on the line. Uh, the, the gold standard is that we would automate uh, through the data collection system on the machine, through the uh, uh, the data bus on the uh, on the equipment that we're collecting all of the downtime and all the, all of the speed and all of that. We're collecting that electronically, and we're passing it to the database. Uh, without any manual intervention that's that's really really uh, clever a lot of new machines are built that way um, but if you have to record it manually then generally it starts at the machine with the operator uh, and then it moves on to the uh, the process engineer or whoever is looking after the database uh, to go and collect the data and start analyzing it for continuous improvement okay and then last question david griffiths again um, just asking for pharmaceutical um, manufacturing and pharmaceutical packaging, what would be the typical OE average results that you would get, um, whether it's in Ireland or globally? Um, generally, in my experience, I, I, I won't answer that one directly, but, but what I will say is that normally uh, the OE levels uh, 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 in the multinationals is generally higher. Um, so they're generally a little bit more advanced. In the SME sec sectors where we're not measuring it, uh, it's, it's, it, it can be very low. You know, I, I've seen examples where the baseline was down at 20, 25% OEE. Uh, yeah. And that's really fun to get in there and, and, and start working with those companies because they have the most to gain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think I have a, I, uh, from my own experience a long time ago, and the company will remain nameless, but we did an exercise, a manual exercise in OE in a chemical farm API plant, and we got 25 to 30 percent. We measured it over a month um, across the plant, and uh, we got 25 to 30 percent. And uh, when we presented it to the leaders, it was not uh, greeted with a lot of uh, um, open arms in terms of what are we going to do with this? We, we, we sort of felt that we couldn't report something so low on our scorecard. So <laughs> OE was quickly abandoned, which was unfortunate because we'd uh, identified an awful lot of losses, as you can imagine. Um, but there all, another... all sorts, all sorts of losses. But the fact was, it was so low, it wasn't something that we could use or people wanted to advertise. So it was disappointing. It was an opportunity lost. I, I, I think that's exactly the word. That's the opportunity. Right. So, you know, Procter & Gamble have a saying, celebrate the red. Yeah. And no, I will we'll celebrate that red. <laughs> yeah. Not every company has that, uh, I think, um, <laughs> approach. So enough said. But listen, um, Eamon, and everybody for the questions as well. Excellent, excellent questions. And I think we're going to uh, draw tonight's webinar to a close now. I just want to say a few thank yous to everybody, in particular to Eamon. Redmond tonight for uh, coming along and giving a really good presentation. Um, it, it was excellent. And you could see from the questions as well that everybody was engaged. So thank you for that, Eamon. 